Lord, we come to you now so needing you to open our hearts to see once again the wonders of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. If you turn in your Bible, please, to the uh, book of Exodus, passage here that's uh, <coughs> at the beginning of uh, the section on the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1. That's going to be the area we're going to be looking at. Exodus 25, 1. 25, 1. <coughs> and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. This is the offering which you shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. You know, it's always, it's always very interesting in the Bible whenever God speaks. I mean, you know, we have this, we have, we're, we're all used to seeing New Testaments with the words of Jesus in red letters just to highlight out to us, this is what Jesus said. And in the same way, it's always very interesting in the Old Testament to see what God says. So maybe we would have a red letter Old Testament where every time it says, and God said. But then again, that would make most of the Old Testament red letters. But, but why that's so interesting about the red letters for when Jesus spoke or when God spoke in the Old Testament is because it reveals the nature of God. It reveals the heart of God. It reveals what's on God's mind. And this is one of those sections that's so interesting because the key to what we just read is verse 8, which shows us the reason for the tabernacle. The tabernacle speaks of the cross. And here we can see God's intention when he says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the reason that God wanted this sanctuary made, the reason God wanted this tabernacle, this moving temple, if you like to think of it that way, in the desert, was so that God could dwell with them. This is remarkable. This is so foreign to man. You, you look in the book of Daniel, for example, when Daniel, in, in the second chapter of Daniel, when the, when, when the, when the, 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 the king Nebuchadnezzar had these horrifying dreams, he couldn't even remember what they were, but he has these terrible dreams and he can't sleep and they, they've lost, they're gone from his memory and, and, and he's so desperate and he calls in the magicians, the sorcerers, the enchanters, and, can't, and, and, they, and they, they all come and, and uh, he, he, he asks them to, uh, to, 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 uh, to really to reveal what the dream was. It was an impossible task. But one of the things that the magicians said was that the gods, they're false gods, that is, they're idols, the gods do not dwell among men. That was, that, that's what they said. Gods do not dwell among men. Here is the true God, and he's saying, I want to dwell among them. That's what I want to do. Now, when the, 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 but God knew that he could not just dwell among them. They could not just come into his presence until the problem of sin is dwelt with. And so he says, let's take care of that. So he says, here's a tabernacle. The front of this tabernacle is going to be a place where there's going to be animal sacrifices. There's going to be blood sacrifices. There's going to be this, this uh, the, the concept of one dying for another. And, and, and when this is dealt with, then the doors open and we can have free fellowship. This is the way to understand what the cross is all about. The cross is, uh, the, 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 is God's intention to dwell with man. The cross is opening the door so that God and man can have fellowship together, so that God and man can be friends, so that God and man can be tight together. But this, can, this, this just can't happen. So he says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And 
And, and you might think of the cross also in that regard. Let there be a cross, God would say, so that I can dwell with man. Let there be, let there be me, God could speak, in human form, who will, be, who will be killed on that cross, who will suffer, who will take all the punishment that man deserves. Let that happen. God could say, let my blood flow for them so that I could dwell among them. So every time when we look at the cross, we should put those words after it, that I may dwell among them, that God may dwell among us. That w- w- we, see, we, we, we see that the Lord Jesus was God come in the flesh. Why? That God may dwell among us. The Lord Jesus was, w- was, w- was, was killed for our sins. Why? That God may dwell among us. And when we take communion this morning, let's take it also with the idea that as we reach our hand forward and take that that bread, that we say to ourselves, this this was the body, this was the symbol of the body of the Lord Jesus that was broken for us, that he may dwell among us, that he may be our friend. When we reach our hand forward and we take that cup of the juice, which symbolizes his blood, let's do it with a heart that says, he shed his blood that he might dwell among us. Now, when we look at the tabernacle, the tabernacle was very specific. He didn't say to man, well, why don't you just make a place that, uh, uh, that for me to be and, 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 and that'll be fine. No, it wasn't that way at all. There were very specific elements of the, sac- of the, of the tabernacle that had to be brought forward. He said that, and in, in, in he was listing them here, and what we've just read, there was, a, there was a, the... the, the it was called the offering. There was the gold, the silver, the brass, the purple, the blue, and the white linen, and so forth. All of that was very specifically laid out. And then he said, I, I, you, you have all these elements here. I'm not leaving it for you to just make it. He said to Moses, I'm going to show you exactly the pattern of how everything has to be put together. You might say God did micromanage the construction of this tabernacle. Because it had to be exact. Because God had a message. He had a very specific message. There was only one door into this tabernacle, the place where God was. Just as the Lord Jesus is said, I am the door. He might as well have said, I am that door. The only one door. There's not many ways to God. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. No one comes to God except through that single door in the outer court. And as soon as a person went through that court, the f- they, they had better have a sacrifice with them. Otherwise, there was no going. Because the first thing that they saw when they entered that, do- that, 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 that door in the outer court was this large brass altar. Flames coming up from this altar. Priests standing around it with blood on them. Animals dying, blood flowing, blood being collected, animals being, being sacrificed, being burned on this altar. It was so dramatic. And so the first statement that came to a person when they looked at that altar was, my sin was very serious. My sin cost the lives of these animals. Whenever we come to the cross, whenever we come to a time like this, Yes, we're thankful. Yes, we're grateful. Yes, we're happy that the Lord died for us. But there also should be that solemn statement that comes to us just like a person who would enter into that outer court, uh, into the outer court and see the brazen altar. My sin did that to him. I'm responsible for his death. It cost him what I did. And that and the right response at the cross is to drop the head, is to drop the head. And to realize we caused that. We caused that. Just like Israel, when they realized in Zechariah, we pierced him. We put him to death. And they dropped the head. And that's the point where God comes and puts his hand under our chin and lifts it up and says, yes, but I love you. Yes, There is a fountain open for sin and uncleanness. Yes, you can be purified from your sin. So we come into the the tabernacle. First there is this altar. 
And it's and again, the goal of the tabernacle was that so that he might dwell among them. So there's not just the outer court of the tabernacle. It's just not just all about the death. But it is for the, to be able to go to the next, the holy place, which is to serve God. To serve God with prayers, the incense rises up. To serve God with with, with, by having fellowship with him, with the altar of the bread, to to be in the in the in the light of his presence from the menorah, from the candlestick, all of that is symbolized there. But then, the greatest, the best, the very best of all, was to enter into the holy of holies, the place where God was. The whole purpose of the tabernacle: let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Let there be a place where their sin can be addressed at the altar. Let there be a way for them to serve me, the holy place, also that I may dwell among them, that they might come into the holy of holies. And there in the holy of holies was God. And he spoke with Moses. He spoke, sorry, he spoke with the high priest, with Aaron there. It was until the actual cross itself, it was a closed up place. There was only one person who went into that holy place of holies. And he only went once a year. And what that caused in the people was a yearning. I wish I could go there. I wish I could go into that holy of holies. I wish I could talk with God. I wish I could hear God. I wish I could speak. All of that was, was, was closed off because of that very thick veil that separated between the holy place and the holy of holies. The width of a man's fist. It's, it's, uh, it's said that even a, uh, a, a team of oxen could not rip that apart. And it stayed that way, closed off, until the cross. And at the cross, when the Lord Jesus died, the veil of the temple, that thick curtain, was ripped from the top to the bottom, as if God took his fist and just ripped it apart. And when he did, it was God saying, at last they may dwell among me. At last the cross. This is what the cross accomplished. It accomplished an entrance for us to God. It accomplished, here was man wanting to come to God. Here was God wanting for man to come to him. But the thick veil was in between because of sin. And man could not, and God could not have man come in because of sin until the cross. And at the cross... God said, finally, and he rips the veil apart, and now there's the free fellowship. So when we come to a time like this in the communion, and we take the bread and we take the juice, this should be a reminder to us. All this was done because God wanted to accomplish, and he did accomplish his purpose, which was, I may dwell among them. They may dwell among me. It's, it was all so that we could be friends with God. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. And so this is, this is what we want to keep in mind. And it was very specific. It was very specific as God told him exactly the materials to use, as God told him exactly what to do with those materials. So it was. The lamb had to be without blemish. God looked around at all the angels. He looked around at all men. And he said, there is no one, there is no one who can substitute for a sacrifice for man's sin. And so then God said, I will do it myself. I have to do it myself. I will do it myself. And he disrobes himself from his robes of glory. And he takes on a robe of flesh, as it says in Philippians 2. And he humbles himself. And he comes down this staircase from heaven to earth, so to speak. And as he does, he's there as a servant. Not even as, an ex as, a, as, a, not as a king on earth. He's there as a servant. And he's obedient. And he's obedient to the Father. And the Father says, here's the cup. You must drink this cup. And at first he shuns away and says, no, not that cup. If it be possible, some other way. Not that cup. But he says, nevertheless, thy will be done. So he broke through the barrier of his own unwillingness, of the horror of it, the detestation of it all. And he breaks through. And he lays down his life. And he suffers. And he dies. And he bleeds. All so that at the end, he could cry out, it's done, it's accomplished, it's finished. And when he does that, then the veil of the temple is ripped. Then God can have fellowship with men. 
then God can say, not that I may have fellowship, but that I now do have fellowship with them, with man, because of the cross. So when we look at the cross, we want to keep in mind God's intention with the cross. He wants to be friends with man. He wants to have this fellowship with man. He wants to live with man forever. And the cross was the way that he removed the obstacle. He broke down the barrier of our sin when the veil was rent in two. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for your heart of hearts, Lord. Your heart of love. Something that we could never imagine that you really wanted to be with us. Something, Lord, that, 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 that only God, through his love, through his wonderful grace, could want. And Lord, we thank you. We stand amazed in the presence, Lord, of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love us, sinners condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, Lord, your grace, your love. Help us now, Lord, as we take communion this morning to once again remember that you so loved the world that you gave your only son. In Jesus' name, amen.